When I first thought of Jesus in the desert wilderness being tempted by the devil with all he can eat, ultimate power, even invincibility, I thought of the anti-drug campaigns that were started in the early 80s with Nancy Reagan's message of just say no, just say no. Even though he was half starved, he'd been fasting for 40 days in the desert and he was being offered food, just say no. Well, anyone that's ever dieted knows it's not as simple as just saying no. All Jesus had to do was show a little restraint, a self-restraint and willpower, just say no. So apparently researchers have had a lot of time to study whether this approach to stopping temptations actually works, particularly in the context of drugs and teens. Uh, Keith Humphreys, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford University, a former drug policy advisor to Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, spoke recently on a national radio program explaining that the problem with the Just Say No campaign was that it really didn't resonate with kids. Some of the elders or more uh, senior populace thought they were, it was a great campaign. But in fact, for the kind of kids who are a bit rebellious and maybe would tend toward getting involved in drugs, it was more of a message that they heard that if you really want to irritate your elders, then this is a good way to do it. Instead of saying, no, go ahead and you'll make them mad, which actually motivated the teens more. Now, according to my, one of my favorite authors, Barbara Brown Taylor, the reason Jesus is able to say no to all of Satan's tempting offers is that despite 40 days in the wilderness and not eating, he's actually full. He's already got everything that he needs, and he doesn't feel that he needs anything more. For Jesus is all about worshiping God and doing God's will in his life. There doesn't seem to be much time or energy for anything else. That is his sole focus. And so the devil's temptations weren't really tempting at all. It reminds me of that sense of uh, our understanding of addiction. A uh, 12-step program, people would resonate with this, that often they'll say that addiction is really uh, an effort to fill a spiritual void or vacuum in a person's life. So those Just Say No campaigns to stop teenage drug addicts as research suggested, they didn't really help at all, and that kind of approach wasn't very effective to stop, say, premarital sex or alcohol addiction either. Ironically, in states that um, promote or certainly educate about uh, protection for sexual partners, actually the pregnancy rate of teenagers goes down but in restricted areas, it tends to be higher. So go figure. Similar psychology, I think. What does work for programs for teens trying to keep them away from drugs and alcohol were alternative ways of spending their time. Programs, youth groups, sports, community, involvement in helping others so that it filled their time and their sense of self-worth, identity, and purpose, so that drugs had no or far less pull on them. According to Humphrey's later campaigns, they tried another approach, something called above the influence, in about 2006, and it copied more what had been done through the tobacco, the d desire to stop kids from being uh, in, enticed into starting smoking. Just a little aside, being that I'm married to a brand guy, whole lifetime career in marketing and advertising. But if you remember uh, Camel cigarettes, had that funny little picture of the camel on the side of the package? Well, they realized that a cartoon package like that was more appealing to kids, so they could start them smoking earlier. Mm -hmm. In that campaign, the above the influence, in that campaign, they said to kids, the tobacco industry is run by people your parents' age who think you're easily influenced, AKA, camel cigarettes, and they basically want to addict you. 
And so this later campaign focused on the idea that if you want to show that you're free from their influence, don't smoke. You are basically empowering kids to make their own choice rather than telling them what to do. And according to Humphreys, that approach worked a lot better. So what you're saying to young people is if you want to be cool, independent, not under the thumb of your elders, you have the power to choose something else. And that resonates more. I'm thinking of, even in Canada, our don't drink and drive slogan. That was changed to arrive alive. See the difference? It's just a slight little uh, emphasis changes from don't do that to do this, but in this way. Interesting thing, Barbara Brown Taylor wrote on this passage of Jesus' temptation and focused more on where it took place rather than what was actually said and done while there in the desert. And she wrote that we can all identify with being in that desert wilderness at some point in our lives. It may not have been dusty and hot and sandy. It might have looked more like a doctor's office or an emergency ward. Wilderness might have looked like the inside of the car you had to live in when you were evicted from your home. It might have looked more like the dark night of grief you've been living in for months with, with no sign of light at the end of the tunnel. Wilderness, Taylor suggests, that most of us spend most of our time trying to avoid such experiences or places in our lives. And yet it's the kind of place where we might actually discover who we are and what the meaning of our lives is too. I think of the wilderness of the young man in Florida who felt compelled to open fire on his classmates and teachers. I think of the wilderness of the families of those killed and how lost and devastated they must be feeling and how they must be wondering how they got to this place called my child won't be coming home from school today. <coughs> Taylor goes on to suggest that wilderness sounds like the kind of place you'd never want to be and yet even if we don't want to be there and do everything in our power to avoid it once we're there she writes and I quote the wilderness is one of the most reality-based, spirit-filled, life-changing places a person can be. And she asks, what did that long, famishing stretch in the wilderness do to Jesus? It freed him from all devilish attempts to distract him from his true purpose, from hungry cravings for things with no power to give him life, from any illusion he might have had that God would make his choices for him. After 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus had not only learned to trust the spirit that had led him there, but to trust that same spirit to lead him out again, with a kind of clarity and grit he could not have found anywhere else. We've all had challenging times in our lives. Perhaps we're living in them right now. I know for myself there is times when I've been taken away from my comfort zone Times when I've wondered if I'd have the strength to keep going, wondering if the pain and hurt I was feeling would ever go away, feeling lonely and lost and without direction and distant, sometimes separated from those I loved and even God. Most recently, I think of my time on the Camino, where I found myself wondering what had possessed me to think that I could take on such a walk in the first place. The wilderness the time away and apart from what is comfortable and familiar and secure can be frightening and even deadly. Yet to come through such an experience, be it physical, mental, or spiritual, is to find strength and grit and even faith that you might otherwise not have known existed. That's what I found. There was no specific moment or experience, no lightning bolt from the sky. But gradually over the long days on the Camino, my blisters healed, the intense heat subsided, the hostile cots became more comfortable, and I began to feel stronger and capable of the journey I was on. There were more tears of joy and laughter rather than pain and discouragement. There were less strangers and more friends. There were fewer scary trails and more amazing sights and sounds of nature. 
My sense of God's presence and love grew stronger and more real with every step and every kilometer. I think that's what happens in our wilderness as a people of faith. Even people of no faith or lost faith or uncertain faith. There is faith, however hidden or deeply felt, and we discover it or catch glimpses of it in our own wilderness times. Sometimes we lose it, too. And so we pray for one another in whatever wilderness we know our companions might be journeying. And that's where community is important, to support and nurture and care for one another when we haven't the strength or conviction to do it for ourselves. My daughter and I used to often say we were glad that we both had meltdowns at different times on the Camino because if we'd had them at the same time, then we would have been in trouble. In his book of Daily Meditations, Radical Grace, Richard Rohr writes that the Hebrew people entered the desert away from Egypt, feeling themselves as a united and strong people. And you'd think that perhaps they would have experienced greater strength as they continued, but not so. For time in the wilderness can wear you down. They experienced fragmentation and weariness. They experienced divisions among their people. They were not the people they thought they were. The Jewish exodus, he writes, is a rather perfect metaphor for spirituality. He says, when all of our idols are taken away, all of our securities and defense mechanisms, we find out who we really are and what we're really made of. We're so little, so poor, so empty, and a shock to ourselves sometimes. But here's the good news. God takes away our shame, and we are eventually able to present ourselves in an honest and humble form. And then we find out who we really are and who God is for us, and it is more than enough. That is how an enslaved people become God's people through the wilderness. They become Israel. We call this season Lent, a time of reflection and sharpening of purpose. The early church announced a season of Lent from the old English word Lenten, meaning spring, not only a reference to the season before Easter, but also an invitation to a springtime for the soul. Forty days to cleanse the system and open the eyes to what remains when all comfort is gone, even chocolate. Forty days to remember what it is like to live by the grace of God alone and not by what we can supply for ourselves. In her book, Blessed Are the Consumers, I have been challenged by Sally McFaig's perspective on our North American culture of consumerism and how it is really a prophetic calling to any people of faith to live differently, to live with less so all might have what they need. It is a new way of looking at our economy and ecology. It is a wilderness of unknown and uncertain territory for me, yet I feel compelled to enter it to see what God's Spirit wants to teach me there. It is this Lenten time, this time of spring cleansing our souls and seeing what we might discover there that might in fact bring us new life. What do you really desire? What are the demons asking of you? What are the things that you need to say no to? Or how rather can you choose self-restraint out of love of God, yourself, one another? My prayer for all of us this Lenten season is that we might take the time to step aside, step out of our normal routines, to take a self-imposed step into whatever wilderness might be there for us. Or perhaps you're already there and not by choice. And while we're in our wilderness places, let us pray, let us sing, let us weep and lament, let us let go, let us face our demons head on and say, we are beloved children of God, 
and we will spend our time and energy worshiping God and serving God because that is what makes us children of God and that is what sets us free. Jesus responded to the devil's temptations. You must worship the Lord your God and serve God alone. And the devil left him. And then the angels came and took care of all his needs. Amen.